Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. This will be our last week in the Gospel of Mark. It's impossible to review everything that we've looked at thus far. Suffice it to say that the Gospel is wonderful news, and it's uh, very personal to me and very practical, and you just can't ever get enough of it. So, we'll let them dismiss it. Let them dismiss, and then we'll read our text this morning. If you're in chapter 16 of Mark, if you'll look down with me, and uh, we will uh, begin reading in, in verse 14, but our text this morning will really be verses 16 through 20. Verse 14 in Mark 16, speaking about Jesus, the Scripture says afterward, He appeared unto them, unto the eleven, as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall not be, or shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And in these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we would ask that this morning that as we look to your word that Father, it would not be a text, it would not be merely a book, but Father, that we would have the right perspective that this is indeed your word. God, I ask that you would give us the confidence this morning that we can believe you and that your word is the greatest evidence, the greatest testimony of its own truth. Father, I pray that this morning that you would allow us, by seeing these promises, Father, to look at the things in our lives that might be lacking that are your promises. God, I pray that this morning that if there would be a person in this room that does not know Jesus as their Savior and has not believed, Lord, I ask that this morning would be their day of salvation. We do ask that the, you would be with our message this morning. God, I pray that you would work in the hearts of the hearers. God, be with me as I endeavor to preach your word. We ask that you would give me the power of your spirit. Help me not to say things that oughtn't to be said. And Father, help me not to withhold anything that you would have me to say. We ask that you would lead and bless our service. Do the work that you want to do in it. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, a couple of things that I think are worthy of our consideration, but not too much consideration, are uh, that this passage of Scripture is not often preached, and it's very often disbelieved. If uh, you've got different copies of the Scripture, there are marginal notes uh, in this portion of the Scripture in uh, Bibles that aren't, um, I guess, like our Bible. And uh, one of the notes would say that better... Uh, better the better text don't contain this passage, and it's not there. So better copies or versions of the scripture don't have these texts in them, and um, so if you believe that this morning, you won't get anything at all out of this message because you don't even believe it's the word of God, and so it doesn't have any kind of authority at all. And so I just want to just state right from the beginning that there are some Bible doctrines and truths here that are not preached many times, first of all, because individuals don't believe that they belong in the Scripture. And the second reason that they're not often preached is because many individuals think that they are difficult because of a misinterpretation of these texts in which false doctrine arises. Now, I don't have the privilege of being from the South, even though I sound like it sometimes, uh, but many of the individuals in the South, particularly areas like Tennessee and Georgia, are very familiar with the false doctrines that arise from this text, which of course be the snake handling churches. Now, um, I wouldn't mind watching a video of a snake handling service, but it's not the sort of thing I want to do in person. And uh, not only do they do have, the, have they made an ordinance out of this passage of Scripture to handle venomous serpents, but they also drink poison, and individuals have died as a result of this nonsense. But I would submit to you this morning that it is most of the time text like this one 
in which there are many distractions that Satan uses the distractions to keep believers from having great and precious promises that literally are so important that they're life-changing. And I believe this is one of those texts. I think that the distractions this morning, if we were to just call them what they are, is an attack on the Scripture, and secondly, an attack on Bible doctrine by misinterpretation of it. And truly, as believers, we have had some of our most precious promises that our Lord Jesus gave us and particularly in regard to the promise of the power of God's Holy Spirit in the life of believers, robbed from us by misinterpretation, radicalization, and I shouldn't even say radicalization because it's a radical Bible doctrine, but uh, taking the things to the extent that uh, false doctrine is taught as a result of it, and so we avoid the doctrine because of the false doctrine, and that's not a correct approach at all. This passage of Scripture ought to mean something to you as a Christian, and ought to have some, you ought to have some experience as a uh, as a result of what God has done in your life uh, to corroborate that. Now, let me make a couple of statements this morning as I try to uh, bring our focus into the text this morning. And uh, just a couple of things that are in our text that I think are important. And that is, if you will take in your Bible and you'll look down to verse 20 of chapter 16 in Mark, there's an important phrase at the end of the verse. We'll read the whole verse, but there's an important phrase that I would say that we could take a proposition from this morning that's important to us as Christians. I want to make some statements that I think that you should be comfortable in making yourself. The Scripture says they went forth. This is speaking of those individuals that obeyed the command of the Lord Jesus when He ascended into heaven. The Scripture says they went forth and or it preached everywhere the Lord, and interesting, that's capital L-O-R-D, which is a reference to Jehovah God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So we know who it is. It's, it's the indwelling Christ who is in a way that is beyond our comprehension, dwelling within us as, as God the Holy Spirit and God the, God the Son. That's an important Bible teaching, Bible doctrine, and it's uh, beyond our comprehension because we don't comprehend. I don't, I don't mean to make light of it, and I don't hope to be controversial this morning, but we don't comprehend how God is who He is. We don't understand the three-part person of God, and I've heard all kinds of illustrations. Every one of them falls apart. And the fact is, is that if you and I could relate to who God is uh, as three persons, by the way, it's not three parts. We understand being body, soul, spirit, heart, will, mind, emotions, and we're referred to in the Scripture as thousands of beings. I don't subscribe to the doctrine that teaches we're a three-part being or we're a two-part being. The fact is God made us one-part beings and the original fall of man's sin is what has caused us to be physically or spiritually separated from our bodies and separated from God. God didn't create us that way. It wasn't God's original intent for man to be fallen and to be sinful. But there are complications that result from sin. And you know, sin always complicates things in such a way that there's not good answers for why we are the way we are. The Bible refers to us as a person in many ways. It refers to us as, the, as our uh, bowels, as our heart, as our emotions, as our feet. And you look at the way the Scripture refers to us, you can't divide us up into one or two parts. We're all chopped up. We're all messed up because of sin. But Jesus Christ is the solution to that. He brings us back together again. Amen. And so uh, that is something that we do well to remember here. But before I get off too far on that, I want to just point out that the, one of the Bible doctrines, though, that is taken away from us is this whole doctrine of God's Holy Spirit being able to empower us. Now, let me just qualify this morning, unless you're afraid of what I'm going to say or what I'm going to do. I don't believe in things that the Scripture, first of all, condemns and says not to blame on the Holy Spirit of God. I don't believe that those things are what the Scripture is talking about here. Snake handling is nonsense. It's ridiculous. If God wants you to handle snakes, He'll call you to do it, and you'll know for sure you're supposed to do it. It won't be something you're doing as an ordinance. Um, being slain in the Spirit or doing signs are not something we'll practice in our church. Now, Although we have once did have somebody that was trying that, um, and I don't want to point out who it was. It was my father-in-law. Um, anyway, uh, he's here. And so we've only one time had somebody collapse during a service, but I think it was more due to an insulin issue than it was to uh, something that God, the Holy Spirit, did. He didn't do it. And so you can ask him about that later. He'll claim it never happened, but I saw it. And uh, <laughs> so there you go. Um, he's been razzing me all week, and I have not said a word. I've left him alone, but now I had to uh, just put a little dig in there. So 
that's see extra. The DVD. <laughs> <laughs> he cut it, but there's a spot there where the camera was looking at the ceiling. Anyway, um, the fact of the matter, folks, is that there is a great and precious promise here. And I want to make a statement to you this morning that I think will help you, and that is that there is that our experiences do are not the proof of our faith, but we can expect our faith to be corroborated by our experience. In other words, many individuals believe things because of what they experience or think they experienced. And I just want to tell you something. Experience and the perspective on experience is not always the same as what actually happened. And you say, Pastor, that's not very nice to say that. It's a fact. I uh, spent several years working with teenagers, and I can tell you something, that if you were to take any of my former youth and ask them about youth group events which occurred, there are things that they experienced that never happened. And I'll leave it at that. For instance, one time I drove, according to the experience of one teenager, I drove our church van 1,700 miles to camp using only my knees. Um, another time, uh, and it didn't happen, that did not happen, by the way, and if you're afraid of your teenager riding with me, just trust me, I don't drive with my knees. Another experience that happened, that never happened, but a teenager believes happened, is we were driving down the road, and we set off smoke bombs in the van, and so the whole van was on fire and was smoking, and uh, that is as we were traveling down the highway, and that sort of thing. I'm telling you something that did not happen. It did not happen. I promise you it didn't happen. And I'm telling you the truth. But they had an experience somewhere that related to that. The experience might have been that once we got to camp, while the kids were sitting in the van, somebody set off a smoke bomb in a van that was sitting still. But we were not driving down the highway. And we were not. And that might or might not have happened. I don't even remember that very well. But my point in this is this. I've been a little bit silly, but I hope that you understand what we're trying to say this morning. And that is that your experience is not a very great authority because you're not very accurate. And if what happens to you has to do with what you will or you will not believe, my friend, you will believe almost anything or not believe almost anything. And our context today says that the result of believing or not believing is damnation if you believe the wrong way. And so I want to say to you this morning that you begin by believing in Jesus Christ, but there are things that are Bible promises that will confirm your experience in Jesus Christ. And I am telling you something, there are great promises for Christians that you can expect to see fulfilled in your life in a way that will be absolutely supernatural because God is real and that God's Holy Spirit is extremely uh, able and powerful to do things that God promises. Now I want to uh, qualify our text with one more thing this morning, and that is this. This is not expired. This is not expired. What the Scripture teaches here is not something that used to be a promise, was a confirmation of the early church, and is not something that Christians today can expect to experience. Many believers think that God is through working in a supernatural way, and I think that's really a shame. It's really too bad because, first of all, they're not ever going to see God work. Secondly, God is not going to be able to do things with them that He could have done, and they're going to be rendered useless for service. Now, I just want to remind you about something before we get into our text this morning. I'm glad that the Scripture ends this way. I want to remind you that a believer is expected to be, be filled with the power of God's Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that feeling, he's expected to see things happen. Right. Namely, the greatest miracle that happens when a believer is Spirit-filled is that lost come to Jesus Christ in a wonderful way. And secondly, you will see God do things in order to cause the gospel to go forward in a supernatural way. Now, I just want to propose to you this morning that if this is the Word of God, and if it's true, then we ought to have great expectations as a result of preaching the gospel. So you want to know what the message is this morning? You can call it great expectations. If this is the Word of God, and it's true, then we ought as Christians to have great expectations as a result of preaching the gospel. Now, I don't think we need to debate this morning. Now, there would be individuals that would, but I don't think you'd find it from the Scripture. I don't think that we need to debate that the primary job or role in the life of a believer is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do a study on the word preach sometime in the New Testament. You'll be surprised to find that it very rarely finds its context in the church house. 
So many times preachers emphasize preaching and it's not preaching at all because it does not contain the gospel or does not emphasize the gospel and it's the object of preaching is not the lost. Preaching literally means I preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And our context today is this is who Jesus was and this is what you can be because of who Christ was. That's the book of Mark. That's the summary of all the gospels. This is who Jesus was and this is what you can be because of Jesus. Now let's just look at some things that happened along with our, uh, or that were happening concurrently with our text. Last week we looked at the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and that Christ appeared in a miraculous, marvelous way with his disciples. And last week, one of the things that we saw was that he was seen for 40 days. That was in the book of Acts in chapter 1. So Jesus didn't just wasn't just raised from the dead, uh, sent a telegram to Mary Magdalene, and uh, said, tell the disciples in the whole world that I'm raised from the dead. No, <coughs> he not only did it, but he came to them, appeared to them in our text in Mark chapter 16, upbraided those that had not believed or had not received the word, and the reason that he upbraided them was not because they did not take the word of other people. It was because they did not believe him at his word. He said that I'm going to destroy this temple in three days. I'm going to be risen again. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the nation of Israel who had made a choice of unbelief about Jesus Christ set guards over the tomb because they understood that Jesus had prophesied his resurrection. And yet his, the disciples of the Lord Jesus, after the resurrection had an attitude of unbelief. Now, friend, it wasn't, they, uh, it wasn't something that had to do with their salvation. They believed in Jesus. That Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. He knew who Jesus was, and Jesus recognized that. But friend, they, did, they, just, they wouldn't receive the witness of men for the resurrection. And the fact is, is that the Bible says if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, and this is the witness that God hath given of His Son. Now, I want to point this out. It's important to understand that the greatest evidence of anything is that it's in the Word of God. The greatest evidence that anything is true is that it's in the Word of God. In the same context of which we're speaking, if you'll go to, uh, don't do it this morning, but if you'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when you see the Apostle Paul explaining to the church at Corinth what the gospel is, in that context, he gives, uh, he corroborates his witness. He said Jesus Christ was risen. He was seen of witnesses. 400 at one time. For this many days he was seen. And then he said he was seen of me also. And so I have seen the resurrected Lord Jesus. But then he says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And he, he references the scripture. Peter does the same thing. In 1 Peter chapter 1. And he says if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And this is the witness that God hath testified of his son. And so the evidence for the resurrection, my friend, the greatest evidence for it is available today. Peter died physically. Paul died physically. The 400 witnesses died physically. The saints that were resurrected and went into Jerusalem at the time that Jesus uh, rose from the dead, they ascended into heaven. They're gone. And friend... The physical witnesses are gone, but there's a better witness. And I hope this morning that you understand how precious it is to have the Word of God that you can look to and believe. And it's the greatest evidence. So I want to point out to you this morning as we look at some promises that are for us, that the greatest evidence that these promises are true is not your experience. But the greatest evidence that these things are true is that the Word of God says so. And if God says so, friend, then it's so. And so when the Bible speaks, it's God speaking for us. And so that is so. Now, I just really want to make a point this morning. That's just about it. And uh, so let's get around to making it here in just a minute. We'll begin by saying this. The promise. The promise in this passage of Scripture and in all the other Gospels is the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I've heard uh, messages preached on the ministry of God's Holy Spirit, uh, that the Holy Spirit has a ministry of indwelling every believer that's true that the holy spirit has a ministry of sealing us of uh, keeping us doing what jesus did when he was in the world uh, when jesus was in the world he, he prayed before he went to the cross he said father i have kept them that thou hast given me and now he said now you keep them and not only keep them but keep those that will believe and he was referencing the ministry the keeping the sealing ministry of god the holy spirit to protect us if you will from the thing that's impossible, and that is losing our salvation. 
And so is the sealing ministry of God the Holy Spirit. Friend, these are wonderful truths. There's the teaching ministry of God's Holy Spirit. Do you remember <coughs> what happened when you received Christ as your Savior and you began to see the Bible in a whole different light? Literally, you began to see the Bible with light. You went from it being a mystery book, from it being a bunch of fables, from it being a bunch of strange stories that you couldn't really understand or make a lot of sense out of, and not understanding the purpose of why things are written, to it just being plain as the nose on your face. And understanding that anybody else that had the same attitude understood the Bible the same way you did. And you're just amazed at the truth that was there. That It's like, where did this come from? I've had access to this all my life, but I've never seen it before. The fact is you never had access because you did not have the enlightening ministry of God's Holy Spirit to teach you and guide you into truth. But friend, I just want to tell you something. Practically speaking, those things are wonderful. And they're great, precious promises, but the promise... For power is greater than that. Amen. It is very obvious, very plain from the Gospels, from the Scripture. The conclusion of the Gospels, go ye. <clears throat> Book of Matthew, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. How is he with us always? Mm -hmm. God the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, the book of Mark, we've just read our context, and the context is detail on how he's going to be with us. You're going to have protection from things that are harmful. Snakes won't be able to kill you. You'll speak in languages that you don't know. You will have supernatural power too, and it just and it goes on. The book of Luke concludes the gospel. Chapter 24 and verse 29 gives us another commission to preach the gospel. The book of John, similarly, you don't have to turn there. We don't have time to this morning. I'm just citing these things to help you understand that the purpose in the life of a believer is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's plainly commanded, and it is something that encompasses our purpose. Now, here are some shortfalls or some deadfalls, if I could take a minute to mention them, with preaching the gospel. or I guess we could just call them excuses. doesn't work. I heard people say, well, I've preached the gospel and it doesn't work. That's just not true. Nobody that preaches the gospel can say that by experience. They say it by surmising or by what they think, but it doesn't work because they don't do it. Well, you know what? There's no point in preaching the gospel if you're not right with God. You ever heard that one? Mm -hmm. Don't preach the gospel if you're not right with God. Well, friend, that statement is phrased all wrong. Get right with God and preach the gospel. That's the way the statement is phrased. You know, uh, sometimes... I think that I've preached things that are counterproductive for us and, and mislead and deceive us. And that is that I believe that going without power is pointless. But the point of believing that is that we must be empowered to go and we must go. You see. But most Christians are like, well, I, you know what, I'm not right with God, so I can't go preach the gospel. I'm not qualified. Friend, go and get qualified on the way. It doesn't take very long to... Uh, experience that First John chapter 1 and verse 9 is true. And that if we confess our sins, we say, God, I agree with what you say about my sin. I'm not in fellowship with you because of my sin. But I believe that it's sin. And, and God, I accept that your attitude toward it is the attitude that I must have. I agree that it's wicked and that you hate it and so I hate it. And God, I'm asking you to forgive me for it. God will forgive you and you'll be qualified to preach the gospel. You say, Pastor, you shouldn't preach the gospel without first praying. I agree. I want to tell you something. You can preach the gospel and be absolutely, it, it, it seems as though you're just in your own strength, your own power, and it's just fruitless. The point of that is not to say, well, don't preach the gospel because it's not succeeding. The point is, get God's power in your life. Get in fellowship with the Lord. Take care of the matters that would keep you from being what God wants you to be. And I just want to tell you something. I have found by experience that corroborates the Scripture that preaching the gospel fixes all my other problems. It just does. Mm -hmm. One of the most practical things in the world that you can do that will help you get straightened out. You're a mess. You feel like, well, I can't do it because of this, can't do it because of that. And it seems like preaching the gospel is the furthest thing from your mind. I don't know how. I'm not qualified. I'm not an experienced. I don't, in all the things. And it just seems like that's the furthest thing from being what I need in my life right now. You go preach the gospel and prepare yourself to do it. And you'll find out that everything in your life just got straightened out. Mm -hmm. Battle and depression, go preach the gospel. I'm telling you, it'll fix it. 
You get yourself depressed, go out and tell people that they have eternal life and that you're never going to die and that you have a hope not only of putting aside this skenos or this tent or this tabernacle, but being clothed with a permanent body in heaven that you have, are going to have fellowship with God. You're no longer going to be bound by sin. And if that doesn't take you out of depression, I don't know what will. It just will. It's a fact. It's practical. And preaching the gospel, my friend, is one of the most practical things that you can do. It's important that we understand that what is included in the last portion of the book of Mark has some detail that will help us in doing that. And that is that you cannot do it without God's power. You cannot do it without God's power. I don't want to spend a lot of time this morning trying to prove that we need to be preachers of the gospel. It's just so plain in the scripture that if you don't agree with it, it's because you don't want to, not because you cannot. It's a choice. Now, so what are these promises? We began by saying we believe this is the word of God, and I will not apologize for that. Um, I'd be really sad to think that you didn't think so, but it wouldn't help you any. So let's deal with our text this morning very quickly. Verse 17, the Bible says, These signs shall follow them that believe. Okay. Who are they that believe? Is it the apostles? Is it the ones who have already believed? No, it's the ones that are going to believe. I love it when the Scripture references me. When it gets really personal. You ever see the scripture get real personal about you? I love it, the prayer of Jesus when he's going to the cross and he prays for his disciples. And he, he's upbraided them for their belief and he's told them that they need to pray. And he prays for God to keep them, to protect them, and to restore them. And all these things. But then he gets very personal in his prayer and he says, I pray for them that will believe. And who he's talking about is me. That's personal. When God the Son is praying to God the Father on my behalf, that means something. I want to tell you something. Anybody in our church that prays for me, thank you. Thank you. I was reading a book on prayer last week, and it kind of convicted me a little bit. And One of the statements, I don't know if it's scripturally supported or not, but it definitely <laughs> made me think. It said, you know, any success that you've had in your ministry, uh, many times is not even your own success. It's the result of the prayers of others for you. I think that sometimes is true of many of us. You say, how did God work? Well, probably somebody prayed. Specifically, God the Son. I'm honored to have someone pray for me. There are folks in our church that pray for me every day. It makes a difference. I remember a dear, sweet lady that prayed for me from the time I was a teenager going through college. I remember the day she died, and I knew it. Before anybody ever told me, because she didn't pray for me that day. I remember what a difference it made in my life. And did... Just thinking, man, who's going to pray for me now? <laughs> because she died. And it means something because God answers prayer, you see. doesn't? It's not something that we're commanded to do because it's useless. We're commanded to do it because He answers it. And when you, when you pray, God answers it. And God the Son prays for us and God the Father hears Him. I hope that's a precious nugget, a precious truth for you. God loves you so much. that only did Jesus die on the cross for your sins, but He's interceding. On your behalf, He's making intercessions for you and I. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. He promises more than that. He promises that not only can we have expectations of seeing God work because of prayer, but those that believe are going to have expectations as well. And I just want to point that out to you because I want you to understand this morning that this text is not expired. You know where the Scripture says all in Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable? You know that there's not any Scripture that's not profitable? And if this were expired, it wouldn't be profitable, and so it's not so. Many individuals take Bible doctrine and they teach cessation theology that God has ceased to work in the way that He used to work. And I'll tell you the only thing that ceases is that you cease to see God work. But it's not because He cannot, it's because you don't want Him to because you will not believe. I want to submit to you this morning that this passage of Scripture is as relevant as it ever was because it's the Word of God and it's profitable. And so the Bible says in verse 17 that they that will believe are going to see some things happen. I want to look at those specifically so we don't get crazy here this morning. Um, just a little announcement tonight. We're going to have a special service and uh, we're going to release some snakes. And, <laughs> no. No. Friend, See, this is a misunderstanding of this context. Verse 18, the Bible says, They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. 
Can anyone here think of an account of one that will believe, who did believe, that could give testimony? Say it again. Paul. Remember Paul when he was exiled? Or we were not exiled, but he was shipwrecked in an isle. Here he is, and he is preaching the gospel in power. And a viper comes out of the fire. It's the kind of viper that people know what it is. He throws some, throws some wood on the fire. I've seen this happen before. You ever throw wood down and have a snake come off it? The funniest one I ever saw, and I don't think it's funny when it's me, but uh, I saw it when it was you know, uh, someone else. Funniest one I ever saw was a friend of ours that you know, Dan Marino, was in a bobcat, and he was dropping wood out. Uh, we were doing hurricane work, and he was, he was uh, dropping wood out on the street. And I looked at the bobcat, and I was way back, and the bobcat was bobbing like this and just going up and down. What had happened was he had the grapples, and he dropped, had it up high, and he dumped the firewood, and then flipped the, this up, and a snake flipped into the cage of the bobcat where he was at. And, of course, you know it harnesses you in, and you can't get out. And he's in there trying to get away from the snake, and the bobcat's just bouncing. He about flipped the thing and uh, trying to get out from the snake. Well, these individuals that were with Paul, with the Apostle Paul, were familiar with the viper that bit Paul. And what they knew about it was if that thing bit you, you died. And so it bit them. It bit Paul. And he shook it off into the fire and didn't die. And that's a good context for handling snakes. <coughs> If it will further the gospel for you not to die from it, then God will use it and He'll empower you not to die. In other words, the Bible's talking about healing here. It's talking about God's hand of protection in the life of a believer for the purpose of the propagation of the gospel. Paul didn't go find a viper and say, Hey guys, look at this. I'm really a powerful man. Fasten it on his arm and say, See, I'm not dying. See, this is not something he staged. It's something that God used in his life. And there's a big difference between God doing something supernatural and you trying to show off how powerful you are because you've got God in a cage. And that's the way many individuals believe God the Holy Spirit works in ministry. Friend, the fact is that when you're empowered by God the Holy Spirit, He's got you, you don't have Him. And you work in obedience to how He wants to work, not vice versa. And so he begins to do things that are beyond your ability, beyond your power, in order to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so individuals can believe and be saved. Mm -hmm. You don't stage it. Now, friend, we can talk about what everybody does that's wrong here, but the real question is, when is the last time you saw God work supernaturally in your life so that the gospel could be preached? Because that's the point of the promise. So we can talk about what other folks are wrong about. It really doesn't matter what they're wrong about. The point of the passage is that you've got a promise in the Scripture, and the, and the promise is it's going to happen for those that believe. How about that? When's the last time God did something to help you preach the gospel? And I don't mean help you preach the gospel, but God did something so that the gospel would be preached and you were used. Paul didn't do something supernatural. The people said, hey, he's a God. Paul said, uh-uh. No, sirree. But I know him. And he gave God the glory. And I want to point out to you this morning that not only is this promise not given to us because we don't expect it, but another reason that we don't see supernatural power is because we'd get the glory. We'd get the glory. You ever hear the Man, you got to hear about the revival that's happening in so and so church. You got to see the stuff they're doing over there. It's amazing. And they start talking about this leader. It's always based on a leader. It's a Benny Hinn or a Todd Bentley or a uh, whoever else. Look at the amazing things that are going on there that this guy is doing. God didn't get the glory, my friend. He didn't do it. He didn't. <laughs> By the way, he doesn't want that kind of glory from that sort of nonsense. That stuff is satanic and it is blasphemous against God the Holy Spirit and he doesn't have any part in it and you ought to be careful when somebody blames him for it to go ahead and make it clear God didn't do that. It's not his fault. You can't blame him for that blasphemy. God doesn't make people lay on the floor and bark by, like dogs. He doesn't make people shake and shiver in convulsions. God doesn't do that. The devil does that. You'll look at individuals that are possessed with the devil's spirit and that's what they do. 
God doesn't do that and he shouldn't be blamed for it. Oh, that is blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. It's blasphemy to say that things that God does were done by anyone else. And it's blasphemy to say that things that God didn't do were done by Him. It's blasphemy. We've got to be careful about it. We've got to be clear about it. But friend, don't fear it so much that you're afraid to see God work in your life. Because you ought to have a healthy fear of the holy nature and character of holy God. But friend, it all ought to be so that you can understand what you must be so that God can do supernatural things in you. <clears throat> Let me just make a statement. The Scripture corroborates it, but this passage says it, and so we ought to just believe it. I don't need to sit here this morning and proof text everything I say. God heals and is able to do so very easily. I could give you this morning names of many individuals that I know that have been healed. You know why God does not heal much of the time? Two reasons. One, it's not His will. You know how to know if it's God's will to be healed or not? Pray and ask Him. He'll tell you. He'll make it very plain. One reason God doesn't heal is because it's not His will. Number two, it's because if He did, you go around and brag about how you were healed and tell everybody about your experience and make that the big issue instead of that God is the most powerful God there is and that He's able to save to the uttermost. And if God heals, it's so that He can save the lost, so that He can use the testimony of what He's done in your life to help individuals believe. And God's able. And I want to tell you something. He's able to heal a lot more than we see happen. He does. And He's no more limited today than He ever was. There's a promise in this text that, they're going to, that you are going to be able to uh, speak in tongues, speak with new tongues. You know what I believe about that? I believe that it's possible to speak in tongues. Because the Bible says so. You say, Pastor, but you've got to understand tongues are for a sign. No, the tongues that happen in the church are for a sign. But I'm telling you, the tongues to preach the gospel are given by God. I was reading, interestingly enough, this last week, uh, Dr. Tom Malone's uh, bi biography. He was a pastor in Pontiac, Michigan that uh, the Lord greatly used. One of the testimonies that he gave is something they saw happen in their church was that a man surrendered to the mission field who was tongue-tied. He just couldn't talk. And he could, he could come in the door and you'd say hello to him and he would just stump him. I mean, he, just, he would just finally hang his head and walk away because he couldn't say hello. And the Lord called him to be a gospel preacher. And so Pastor Malone said, you know, on Wednesday night, I want you to share with your church the call that God has given you to preach the gospel. And his wife was called. She surrendered at the same time. So they both on Wednesday night had a game plan. He was going to try to give his testimony. And if he couldn't, then his wife would just take up from there. And he spoke for 30 minutes without ever a stammer or vocal clutter or anything else. He gave the gospel and preached the rest of his life the gospel of Jesus Christ because God healed his tongue. Amen. What a wonderful testimony. That's what God does. He likes to do that. He can and He does. And I think that's a gift of tongues. I don't know about you, but I believe He believed it. You know what happened at Pentecost? Did you ever read Acts chapter 2? All these individuals from Cretes and Arabians, and it goes on and lists all the people that were Jewish that had come to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost were able to hear the gospel preached in their own tongue. I just want to tell you something. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that God doesn't do that anymore. You say, Pastor, whether the prophecies, they shall cease. Yeah, you know why prophecy ceased? Because Revelation chapter 21, 20, was it 22? I always mess that up. I always forget this 21, 20. Anyway, <coughs> Revelation says you're not supposed to add or take away from it. And this is the prophecy. This is it. This is the prophets. You don't need any new ones. Somebody says they're a prophet today. No, sir. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. You know what it's talking about? <laughs> I don't want to get into it this morning. It's not a cessation gift. You say, Pastor, you believe that God could supernaturally enable you to speak in tongues to preach the gospel? He'd be very limited if he could not. <coughs> Wouldn't he? We'd have less of a God today if he could not. And I don't mean to speak pragmatically today about the Scripture. I don't mean to say something's true because of my experience. But my friend, God is just as alive as he ever was. And he's just as able as he ever was. And I know accounts of individuals that have said that they've preached the gospel in tongues. And they're not nuts. They're not quacks. They're not wackos. God's able. 
I want to tell you something. I want to remind you about something we said a minute ago, and that is that if you don't believe, he won't. Amen. Again, on the same token, <coughs> the positive is that is that he can. The negative of it is that we don't go out and say, I'm going to speak in tongues now. I don't need to speak in tongues around here. I got Charlie. <laughs> Seriously. I've got Alex. I've got Maria. Maria's the most tongue speaking lady we've ever had in our church, I think. See, what, you got four fluent languages? Yeah, she's four, fluent in four languages. Probably could learn another one in a day, I suppose. But uh, she's got more than the gift of tongues, I'd say. God's gifted her to preach the gospel and share it. Better use it for Lord Jesus. And God's able, my friend. He's able to save to the uttermost. It just is. But you and I have some expectations. I just want to ask you this morning a question. And that is that do you believe because of your experience or do you experience because you believe? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you know what happens when you have faith? You see God work and do the supernatural. God's very kind to us in our unbelief, isn't he? You ever prayed, Lord, help me in my unbelief? You could relate to the apostles, the disciples who were men. I have. I think you ought to pray. You don't believe, pray that God will help you with it. Friend, I want to tell you something. When you believe, God will work. And one of the things that undermines our faith is beginning by taking away the foundation of the Word of God and His promises and saying they're not so and they're not for us. They don't belong in the Scriptures. One of the attacks not only did not belong in the Scripture, but they're expired. They're old promises. And I want to tell you something, friend. They belong and they're not expired. They're no more expired than eternal God is. I want to remind you of something we say often in our church, and that is God is relevant. God is relevant. You know, we had teach a philosophy that's popular today in the church, and that is that we need to be culturally relevant. And it's wrong. It's not so. We ought to be biblically relevant. In other words, if our culture is relevant to God, it's because our culture agrees with God is what makes it right. But if our culture disagrees with God, then it's irrelevant and needs to be corrected. You know, there's pragmatic philosophy that uh, pragmatic evangelism, pragmatic means just means you just do things on a practical basis. And so we preach the gospel in a way that works. And so if the world are doing this, then we do this to reach the world. And it's a lie. It's not so. The world's not the world is not what God wants it to be. It needs to be corrected, you see. And a Christian trying to be like the world to reach the world is not what he's supposed to be. We're called to be different. We're called to be peculiar. We're called to be separate. We don't go to the mission field and say, hey, let's be careful about not affecting and changing their culture. The buzzword when I was in school was Americanizing their culture. I don't think we ought to Americanize any culture anywhere. I agree with that. But you know that America used to be a Christian culture? And some Americanization of some heathen culture wouldn't be a bad thing. But it's not Americanization, friend. It's a biblification of that culture. If a culture has heathen worships and heathen practices, it ought to be changed. Amen. You see, it ought to be corrected. I'm, and heathen heritage is not a good heritage at all. By the way, Christian, burn your history. Burn your past. I mean it. You're saved from it. Burn it. You know, <laughs> one of the practical things that uh, they used to teach us when I was a young person was that don't drag old relationships into a new one. Mm -hmm. First of all, I told you, don't just get in a relationship. You know what? I'll tell you something. If you're a man here and you've got your love letters from the girl that you dated before your wife, your wife doesn't appreciate it and it's not going to help your marriage burn them. <laughs> not wonderful memories. They're awful memories. They're terrible memories. There's just no good. There's no profit in it at all. You need to forget it and so does your wife. You need to burn them. Um... You've got sin in your past? Be ashamed to speak about it. There's nothing wrong with that. Man, just somebody brings it up, say, you know, let's don't talk about that. It's something I'm ashamed of. I'm not proud of that. I didn't, I'm glad that God saved me from it. Because He saved me from it, let's burn it. Let's get it out of our past. But we go to a culture and we try to reach a people and we tell them they don't have to be changed because, we, because of the lovely tradition of the culture. That's a satanic philosophy and an idea. We need to learn to be biblical culturally. Correct culture with the Word of God. And by the way, God's always relevant. 
The whole premise of cultural relevance is that God is irrelevant. So we've got to adapt the scripture to our culture so that it'll be culturally relevant. So we've got to adapt the way that we live and we act so we can engage the culture so it'll be culturally relevant. And I want to tell you something. Culture is irrelevant. God is relevant. He was the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to tell you something. A hundred years ago, God was more relevant than you are. And a hundred years from now, if the Lord tarries, He'll be more relevant than you are. You need to keep that in mind as you try to adapt God and change Him in every generation. Every generation thinks that God needs to be changed. I want to tell you something. He cannot be. And if you want to adapt Him, you're worshiping a false God. He doesn't exist. And you need to get God relevant. You adapt yourself. And one of the ways for us to do this is if we're wrong in the church about some doctrine that we preach and teach and believe, we need to correct ourselves. And I want to tell you something. The Bible says so, and if you believe it, you'll see it. The Bible says God is able to protect you. The Bible says God's able to deliver you. And the Bible says that God is able to do things with you that man can't explain. Amen. So that the gospel can be preached and souls will come to Jesus Christ. If you haven't seen it, it's because you don't believe it. So believe it and you'll see it. Whereas it doesn't happen before you believe it. Doesn't happen, it doesn't happen when you experience it. You experience it when you believe it. And I promise you, my friend, that this week, it is God's desire and God's plan for you and I to preach the gospel. Anyone want to disagree with that this morning? And if that is God's desire and God's plan, He does not expect you to do it in your own strength because you can't. We're saved by grace and we live by grace. And if God's plan for you this week is to empower you to preach the gospel, don't you think He could do a better job than what you and I think He could do or think we could do? I want to tell you something. If you're going to go this week and you're going to preach the gospel, I don't expect you to be very successful. Don't expect to see Sunday morning individuals that have come to Christ come and be part of this local fellowship if you're going to do it. If we go door-to-door -door visiting this week every day at 11 o'clock and go again in the evening, I don't expect to see much happen as a result of it. Just don't. Because I'll just tell you something, you and I don't have what it takes to bring people to Christ. And that's why this promise. We are powerless as believers because we do not believe that God is able to do what man cannot do. You say, Pastor, I'd witness to people, I'd witness to the lost, but uh, <laughs> i just tell you something. I just, I, it's just not me. I mean... I can hardly talk. I can't talk to strangers. I, I don't, I don't, I'm an introvert. The good news about that is God doesn't expect you to have the ability to do it. He just tells you to obey. And you go and preach the gospel, you'll be amazed at what God can do. Anytime you go and you preach the gospel, if someone gets saved, when you get done with it, and as you reflect on what God has done, you'll recognize, I didn't do that. God did it. And I got to be there. And I got to be used. And by the way, friend, that will change your perspective on preaching the gospel. It will no longer be a burden. It will be a privilege. It will no longer be something that does not excite you and cause you to say, oh, ho-hum, there they are preaching about the gospel again and about preaching the gospel and how we all need to be witnesses. And it's just so much to do. It's just so hard. And it's just not natural. I just don't feel like it. I just don't want to. And you'll change your attitude. And you'll say, man, I got to see God do some things that I never thought were possible. And I was there. You ever been there when something happened? I mean, something great. You ever be the one that was the witness of it? I'm telling you something. I'd rather witness it than do it myself many times. It's amazing what God can do and what He'll do. And we can be witnesses. Oh, we're called to be witnesses, aren't we? You know, witnesses, somebody that tells what God can do. <clears throat> By the way, go ahead and tell people God can do some things. And I'm going to finish with this. One of the things I've learned the last several years to do when I lead someone to Jesus is to tell them that God works miracles. God answers prayer in a supernatural way, and if you'll ask Him, He'll answer your prayer. That's in 1 John chapter 5. You lead someone to Christ, and you take them and show them that God's plan for them is to be saved, and that they can have confidence, that they can know they're saved, they can have confidence. Not only because they ask something according to God's will and He hears them, but if we pray and ask God for anything, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, we know that we have a petition that we desire of Him. Here's what I say to individuals that receive Christ as their Savior. I challenge them. 
I say, let's do something. Do you believe this is true? I say, well, yeah, I do. I say, okay, you think God who created the world, created the heavens, gave us the only way that we could be made righteous and holy and came up with the only possible plan for redemption? You think a God that could do that <coughs> could answer prayer today? Well, I, I think so. I just tell them, here's what you do. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anyone you know what you're going to pray for. But you have something in your life that you know God wants. You know it's God's will. Maybe it's victory over something. Maybe there's something in your life that shouldn't be and you need victory. Maybe it's something that's impossible that has to do with a relationship with someone. And you can't do it. And, it's, and if you had to work it out, you've already tried to work it out and you know you can't. Maybe it's Something that you know God wants to be in your life and it's not there and you can't figure out how to get it there or how to take care of it. Pray for that thing this week. First of all, determine it's God's will. Pray for it. And God will answer your prayer. You know, most of us wouldn't say that because we're afraid He wouldn't. I want to tell you something God promises He answers prayer. It's a promise. It's not just a promise for us that have believed. It's for them that will believe. I'll tell you, that's attractive. Instead of engaging the culture and trying to tell a person that's a mess that we're a mess just like him and that he can come to Jesus and we'll have a mess of fellowship, how about telling them that they can be complete in Jesus Christ? They can be forgiven of their sin. That the things that they've never been able to have victory for in their life, they can have. And these are the things that are promised to believers. In Mark chapter 16, the question I want to ask you this morning is, have you experienced it? Amen. Have you experienced it? Because it's there and it's a promise. And it is the promise of God's power in the life of the believer for preaching the gospel and doing things that are supernatural to accomplish it. It's a promise that's there. It's a promise that's for you. As Dr. McClure used to always say about the sword of the Lord uh, that we offer on the uh, front table, he said, it's free, it's for you, and we want you to have it. And this is for you, Christian. It's free, it's for you, and God wants you to have it. How about that? You going to live it this week? Well, that's our invitation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us to see this wonderful promise that summarizes, that completes the gospel. Lord, help us to believe it. And then Lord, help us to experience it. Father, I ask that you would transform this church into a gospel preaching, soul winning enterprise that is empowered by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we know that if you do that, then man won't be able to receive the glory for it because we didn't do it. We ask that you would help us to take ourselves out of the way and have a proper humility and a proper desire to see you work not so that we can sensationalize something that's already sensational, or so that we can brag about what we've seen and experienced, but God rather instead so that we can know you in a more intimate way and so that you could be pleased with our lives because of our belief. And we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have your invitation.